Well, welcome everyone um, to this second event of the day. And this, this is a, um, a joint venture between Edinburgh Infectious Diseases and the Infectious Diseases Honours class. And we asked them um, if there was an eminent infectious disease scientist who they would um, <coughs> like to invite to Edinburgh to talk to them. And uh, they very rapidly uh, said, sure, yes, and they came up with the name of um, our, sp our speaker this afternoon. <coughs> And I must say, uh, we're very fortunate. It's uh, David Denning from the University of Manchester. And David also um, accepted the invitation uh, with great enthusiasm, and so much so that we were able to uh, extract not one but two different talks out of him. And I think a number of people here were at the lunchtime um, seminar at the QMRI at Little France. Um, and um, David is a, a very distinguished uh, clinician uh, scientist. He's trained in London and uh, with stints in Glasgow and California. And is, uh, is now, as you can see here, he's at the University of Manchester, the National Aspergillosis Center. He's the um, professor of infectious diseases and global health at the university. And he's also um, president of the um, Global Action Fund for Fungal Infections. And there's some um, flyers at the bottom, which have, uh, very nicely sums up those activities. So I think um, people also know that uh, David's active in a, um, I wouldn't say a neglected field, but, but one that, that isn't often in the spotlight in terms of infectious diseases, and that's of uh, fungal infections. There are relatively few centers of, of excellence, and David leads one of those very few centers in Manchester. At lunchtime, he talked about um, um, aspergillus in particular, um, from asthma to TB and transplantation. And uh, this evening, he's going to follow that up with a, a talk about the neglected fungal disease epidemic. So, David, two things. Uh, first, we're very, very grateful that you were um, able to devote a, a whole day and give us two different talks today. That's, that's fantastic. And secondly, we're very much looking forward to hearing your presentation. So thank you, David. Um, well, it's a, it's a privilege to come, and thank you again. Um, the, um, it's only recently I've sort of taken up the cudgel of global health because I've, you know, I've been doing lots of other work before this related to pathogenesis and uh, trying to sequence the Asperger's genomes and develop new drugs and diagnostics and all that stuff. And then it really dawned on me that actually we're not doing a very good job on a global scale with these diseases. Um, there's, there's a lot of interest. But the other thing that's really made a big difference lately is that we've now got some really excellent diagnostic tools uh, or options for diagnostic tools if they're not quite ready to, to take out across the world. And that, I think, is going to make a very big difference across the world. So. Um, what I'm going to focus on today is the... Um, is this, um, this area of the, the sort of the big ones in terms of the impact across the world. Um, I'm going to ignore the, most of the invasive fungal infections that occur in uh, Edinburgh and Manchester um, and you know, big American, French and German hospitals, namely invasive candidiasis and invasive aspergillosis. I'm just, just not going to touch them, not because they're not important, they are, but because I want to focus on the things that affect people uh, in every country, um, or certainly for, in terms of AIDS and TB in particular. So <coughs> as part of the effort to um, address the problems of global health, we set up a, uh, a foundation in Geneva, the GAFI, uh, about two years ago. Um, that is works in association with um, LIFE, which is um, essentially a marketing uh, um, uh, brand for education related to fungal disease and that's supported by Fungal Infection Trust which is a UK charity. And the reason that we set GAFI up in particular was that the, uh, we needed to be able to address and, and have a vehicle for talking to people like UNAIDS and WHO and Gates and others and doing that from a purely academic perspective wasn't going to give the power and impact than we can do from a an NGO type of foundation perspective. And so it was it's intentionally for that reason, uh, and it means that I have to fly to Geneva every so often, which is such a trial given the skiing and things. So, um, anyway, um, so you can put fungal diseases into five 
broadly five boxes. There are one or two that don't fit neatly in these boxes, but you can put them into five boxes. Um, and these include uh, mucosal infection, uh, and which oral and vulval vaginal candidiasis. And I won't talk much about thrush in women, except that um, the women in this audience will often have had thrush at least once. Uh, it's more common in pregnancy. But there's a group of women, roughly 6%, uh, who get thrush four times a year or more often. And we've done a calculation of how common that is around the world, and there's roughly 130 million women with that problem. And this is barely addressed by the literature. It's, it's really awful, the literature in this area, and the treatments and understanding pathogenesis is really uh, deficient in that area. So this is a, a, a need, but it doesn't kill anybody, so therefore it sort of comes down the priority list. And then we've got cutaneous fungal infection, which I will talk a little bit about. We've got chronic infections, which I'll also talk about. There's allergic um, diseases, which I won't speak much about today, uh, but they include uh, severe asthma and fungal sinusitis, allergic fungal sinusitis or rhinosinusitis. And these are numerically very large in number. Um, and probably a few patients die because of severe asthma with fungal sensitization because their asthma is poorly controlled, although it's not well documented. And then I do want to talk about the um, life-threatening invasive fungal infections, but the ones that uh, particularly are a problem in the, in the developing world uh, and, um, I and related to AIDS and HIV. So those of you who know something about fungal disease will be able to recognise all these infections, um, but you may not um, be uh, completely familiar with all of them. Um, and um, you may not have seen patients with disseminated penicillium infections, from, uh, with AIDS in Thailand, uh, or patients with coccidiomycosis from the Americas. This is a purely US, Central and South American disease. Or patients with cerebral aspergillosis, uh, which this is a patient from Pakistan who was a leukemic and developed this as a complication of leukemia. Uh, allergic fungal sinusitis, which is a big, big deal in India. There's a lot of patients in India with this problem. Um, <coughs> disseminated candidiasis, which tends to occur at the extremes of age, so the premature babies and older folk, um, and there's about a 50% mortality in this country, in France and other countries. Um, I will talk a little bit about later about chromoblastomycosis, um, which is a, a chronic um, infection of the skin and subcutaneous tissue, which is a pretty disabling infection. Oral thrush I won't speak about very much, but it's a big problem in HIV infection. And tinea capitis, which is also a big problem, particularly currently in black children in Africa, but not exclusively so. So what about tinea capitis? So roughly 25% of kids in Africa have tinea capitis. This is a huge problem. And in Victorian Britain, <coughs> what happened was that these heads would be shaved and the children, if it didn't get better, would be excluded from school. There's many examples of children being sent to boarding school for three and four years away from their families because they had tinea capitis. Um, in Israel, when it was being set up, they, they, as you know, the Jewish community attracted um, people from all over the world, including some black Jews from Ethiopia and other parts of the world, and they came with tinea capitis. And if they had tinea capitis, their d way of dealing with that was to irradiate the heads to get rid of all the hair, and then the tinea would die off. And they've been left with a lot of people with subcutaneous um, cancers of their head and skull as a result of all of that. So this is, while it's a trivial infection in the sense that few people die of it, actually it's had a lot of social implications. And it still has a lot of implications in parts of Africa because children are excluded from school. They, and these, in, mm, these infections get very inflammatory and painful, um, and that's called carry-on, um, and there's different varieties of that. Um, and it's pretty easily treated with griseofalvin or fluconazole, uh, but it just isn't treated very much. And there's a lot of transmission in schools from um, brothers and sisters and schoolmates and so on with this. And there's a, a cool 200 million kids probably with this infection worldwide. Uh, the other common cutaneous fungal infections are um, ringworm, tinea versicolor, which is this thing here where I don't know if you've had yourself or friends who, when you try and get a suntan, you have a sort of spotty chest and it doesn't look very nice. That's a tinea versicolor uh, infection. And then fingernail or toenail infections. An athlete's foot, of course, is well common. Athlete's foot gives you a crack in the toes 
and um, it's probably one of the ways of getting cellulitis back to the lower leg, which is a really common cause of admission in this country. And all these uh, infections, uh, all these are, are treatable and are treatable quite easily. <coughs> and in the recent Global Burden of Disease work, um, the cutaneous fungal infections were the fourth most common problem after dental caries uh, and two different sorts of headache, uh, affecting roughly a billion people worldwide. So really quite a big problem. Um, and, um, uh, and we're not going to focus on that in terms of Gaffey's work, but it just shows you the scale of the challenge related to this across the world. So we're going to focus primarily on chronic <coughs> fungal infections, particularly chronic blastomycosis and chromoblastomycosis, and invasive life-threatening infections, particularly cryptococcal meningitis and um, pneumocystis pneumonia and histoplasmosis. And if you look at and try and figure out how many patients there are with these infections and how many die with or without treatment, um, you end up with roughly 1.35 million. Um, in fact, in another paper from Gordon Brown in Aberdeen, it was about 2 million. It, it's somewhere in that range of patients. It's not really known. And, of course, they often have underlying diseases as well. So they may have leukaemia, they may have had a transplant, they may have AIDS and so on. And that compares with about 1.42 million with TB and about 600,000 with malaria. Now, both malaria and TB are, of course, infections that need to be addressed, and there's been a huge effort to address them. And the amount of money that's gone into addressing these two infections is in the um, hundreds of millions, if not billions now, in contrast to very little that's gone into fungal infection. So there's a, a disparity here in terms of impact and a resource. Now, one of the reasons that there's a problem is that we don't have very good metrics for uh, how common these infections are, either incidence or prevalence. So there's very little regular or national surveillance. We do in this country count candidemia cases, and there's about 1,800 a year. Um, there's almost no obligatory reporting of fungal diseases. Uh, there's the diagnostic tests don't always do a really good job, and if they do do that, you have to, of course, get the doctor has to ask for them. So if the doctor doesn't think about it, then it doesn't get done. So, for example, candida in the bloodstream for candidemia, uh, the um, uh, uh, ability for that to pick up in basic candidiasis is roughly 40%. And that's, so you pick up 1,800 cases, but you don't pick up the other 60% which of, of patients have got disease. And then if you're not really well trained and attuned to these things, you don't think about it, so the tests don't get done, and then you don't make a diagnosis. And there are some infections that are fairly recent, so therefore there's no sort of history of co collecting all this. If you look at the AIDS deaths around the world, in 2013 is about 1.5 million, and 25% are clearly attributable to tuberculosis, although not all of those are accurately diagnosed, and probably a similar number are due to fungal infections between 25 and 30 percent in, in that range on a sort of guesstimate level. Um, so there's a real effort need to, to do that and we, one of the things we're trying to do is to reduce the deaths from AIDS and in order to do that we have to address the fungal infections. So they've been rolling out antiretroviral therapy across the world um, which has been quite successful. Many, many more people with HIV infection are being treated and they've been treated earlier. So if you go back to 2010 you treated patients with CD4 cell counts less than 350. That got increased to 500 recently. And now, with a few exceptions, like pregnant women where you treated long term, um, and then now, basically, they're opening the doors and saying anybody should be treated. So the idea is to try and really reduce the transmission rate of HIV. And you can see that that actually has been coming down pretty well, the number of new infections, which is good because we don't want anybody, you know, getting HIV. But you look at the death curve, and it's not coming down as fast. And the reason for that is, for, there are many reasons, but one of the key reasons is that the interval between getting antiretroviral therapy and ha having an effect on mortality is long, because you've got to, people have got to come out of their immunosuppression. Some patients who are given antiretroviral therapy get worse, because um, you get an immune reconstitution, and they haven't checked for the underlying diseases, and so you get a... Uh, you accelerate mortality. Uh, but the biggest reason is that many patients with HIV don't know they've got HIV. And so they just come to the hospital when they're ill and they're already really sick and their immune system is pretty much destroyed. 
So we have to address that group because you can recover that group and actually put them back on the road to recovery and they can survive many years if you can do that. So the, the first global assessment of any fungal disease that was published was from the CDC in 2009, only five years ago, and they looked at cryptococcal meningitis and it probably slightly overstates the problem now. I think the, the case numbers have come down. But at that time, you can see that crypto vied with the, the frequency of tuberculosis in Africa. It's a really common problem and similar to childhood diarrheal disease. And, um, and yet the amount of work addressing that was small. For example, the amount of work addressing STDs across Africa was huge. And, and more recently, hepatitis B and C have taken the limelight in various different ways. So given all those rates, what should and what was the public health response to that? And you would expect there to have been, you know, a, a significant response. But in fact, it was pretty muted. So there are WHO cryptococcal HIV guidelines that have been produced um, uh, about two years ago and just about to be reissued with slight amendments this year. Um, very recently, um, uh, this cryptococcal action group that I belong to put forward for amphotericin and flucytine to be placed on the essential medicines list, um, and that has happened two years ago. Um, mycetoma, which is a subcutaneous infection of the uh, usually lower leg, um, was accepted as a nectotropical disease, but there's no money going into it, but it was accepted. Um, the, just at the end of last year, there were skin and oral health guidelines produced by the HIV department at, um, uh, in WHO, although they just sort of slipped onto a website and there was no sort of proper dissemination of these guidelines. There are very few national surveillance programs across the world. Um, even in the US, they do outbreak investigation, but not surveillance. The, the best country probably for this is actually France. They've done a really good job of collecting data. Um, very few dallies and qualies, and you need these disability life-adjusted years or quality-adjusted life years to be able to calculate the impact of your disease, or a disease compared with rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or car accidents or alcoholism or hypertension or whatever. And only for crypto has that been done. Um, and the global burden of disease, which is done by a group in Seattle, have ignored all the fungal diseases. Uh, so that's been a problem for us because that they feed into the Gates um, tradition of, uh, uh, and, that, and that's been a problem. And the economic modelling is only for invasive mycoses in high-income countries, done usually by pharma, because they want to be able to sell their drugs. So they say, oh, these patients are, transplant patients are very expensive, or ICU patients are very expensive, and then they, they can make an economic model. But you, if you're not going to sell your drug, then why would you bother with an economic model? So, so that, there's a very limited public health response. So others have picked up the cudgel. Um, as I mentioned, Gordon Brown before, Mc Graham Minges in uh, South Africa has also been involved in this, and uh, Darius, who's married a Mexican um, uh, woman, is also very interested in this area. So we've decided, and there are lots of reasons for that, and I'm happy to talk about that, to take on six priority diseases. We took on five initially, and they've added chromoblastomycosis recently. So three of these are in AIDS, crypto and pneumocystis pneumonia and um, histoplasmosis, and then chronic pulmonary exposurosis after TB, fungal keratitis and chromoblastomycosis. And these last two occur in completely normal people. These are injury-related infections, and the others have obviously an underlying diagnosis which is, um, which is there. So if you take AIDS, for example, and you take new AIDS patients coming through the door, um, the rate of cryptococcal meningitis varies roughly between 3 and 30%. In fact, in the UK it's less than that, in the Netherlands it's less than that, but in the States it's 3%, and in many other countries in the world it's up, and it can rise it up in uh, northern Thailand, it's up at about 30%. And if you don't treat, if all of these infections are fatal if you don't treat, so we could write 100%, 100%, 100% there. So if you, if you can make a diagnosis or guess the diagnosis you, and you put the right treatment in, then these are the mortality um, rates, and they're still pretty high. Um, pneumocystis pneumonia 
it, it, the rates go from 3 to about 60%. When, when AIDS first came into the UK, 60% of the patients would come with pneumocystis pneumonia. That was the beginning of the epidemic. And then histo is at the, at the lowest rates where you get it at all in Africa, it's about 1% and it rises to around 25% in certain places. So what about crypto? So the, um, the Park study, um, which I mentioned before, estimated their, their median estimate was just under a million cases a year, and their low estimate was 372, and the, the low death estimate was 125 up to about 65 deaths. So that's the sort of range that we're dealing with, and that's, there's remodelling going on to try and figure out if that's the case. There's a fantastic diagnostic test. This, this test here is a, a, a simple lateral flow uh, test which detects antigen. This, the organism is a yeast like this, and it has this um, uh, uh, polysaccharide, complex polysaccharide coat which gets into the bloodstream and the, the spinal fluid and the brain. And it's a fantastic test. It costs $2, takes 10 minutes, and we could train all of you to do this in the room in half an hour. Marvellous test. Um, and that needs to be disseminated across... Uh, Africa because you can identify disease before meningitis occurs because the key problem is meningitis it's a really a difficult problem but you do get this uh, fun fungemic phase uh, before that if you don't treat as I mentioned they all die if you give fluconazole which is pretty cheap now in Africa it's about a 50% mortality over 10 weeks if you give uh, amphotericin B or flucytosine you get about a 75% uh, a survival rate at 10 weeks. So it's still not 100%, and that tells you that we need additional efforts to try and improve outcome in these patients. In this country, the, the, the mortality at 10 weeks is probably about 15 to 20% in an AIDS, AIDS patient. It's somewhere in that range. So you can, you can improve it, but it's hard to get it right up there. If you look at the drugs, the cost of the drugs, the, the quali, and I was talking about qualies and things here, Fluconazole costs about $150 for a treatment course with your 50% survival. If you give amphotericin flucytosine, you're up at about $450. And that, therefore, is about $300 for a 25% improvement in survival. Is that worth doing? Well, in this country, the answer is blindingly obvious. It's yes, because uh, that's one day in the hospital in this country, you know, or one dose of ambosome or whatever. Um, but it isn't quite so clear in many parts of the third world because that's actually quite a lot of money. But if you spread that over all the HIV patients and you want to reduce mortality, actually it's not that expensive. But there's another problem, and that is about drug availability. So one of the things that Gaffey has done is to try and say, figure out where the drugs are because it's all very well saying this is the treatment and that's what the cryptococcal guidelines in 2013 said. This is the treatment you need to give. But when you actually look at them with amphotericin, these are the countries where the drug is registered, all right, in green, and red is it's not registered, and grey is we don't know because we haven't got a contact there. And these are the countries where you actually can get the drug. And there's, that is most of the countries where cryptococcal meningitis is most prevalent. Indonesia has a lot of crypto as well. Some of these Southeast Asian countries have crypto. And it's also a problem in parts of South America. Uh, so you may think that's not too hot, but it's a lot worse with flucytosine. So most of the countries the drug is not registered in, and very few of these countries is the drug available. So that means that actually the drugs which are recommended by the WHO, you can't give. And flu cytosine, you probably know nothing about it. It was registered in the 1970s. It's a really small little molecule. It's dead cheap to make, really, really easy to make. It's just that nobody actually took all the effort to get it into these countries. Because the registration process costs money, and if you're not going to make any money, why would you do it? And who's going to buy it? So there's a real catch-22 problem of what the pull from these countries is to get the companies to do it and how to make that happen. And if they don't charge a lot, they won't bother. If they charge too much, nobody will use it. So it's a really circuitous problem, which we're going to try and unhinge in various different ways with, with advocacy, which is what's required. Now, there's another problem with cryptococcal meningitis. Of those of you who are interested, you get raised intracranial pressure. So most patients with meningitis get raised intracranial pressure. 
Um, and, you know, whether that's a bacterial meningitis or viral meningitis, but it's not usually too high. If we did your pressures in this, in here, it would be about 12 or 15 centimetres of water, typically. These patients can get pressures of 30, 40, 50 sometimes. And what you need to do is you need to drain the spinal fluid. And the way you do that is you do that with a lumbar puncture. So you have a little needle, you well, it's a big needle, long needle, and you stick it in the back. Um, and that's what the needle looks like here. And uh, a lot of patients don't want to have that done, but it's the investigation for, for meningitis. It's absolutely critical. And in order to measure the pressure, you stick on the end of that a little manometer, which you can sort of half see here, which is a three-way tap. And you assemble this manometer, which gives you, you can see that would be 27, that's 30 pressure centimetre, and you get up to about 40. And you can measure how much pressure is coming out with the patient lying on their side like this. Um, and if it's up above uh, 20 or 25, then there's recommendations about doing another lumbar puncture and draining the fluid and, and all that. And then once you've measured the pressure, you then change the thing and you put it into the glucose tube and these other three tubes and you send it off with your cell count and your culture and your antigen and all the other bits and pieces. That's what you normally do. Okay, but the, this kit is not available very easily in Africa. Nobody's making it in Africa. Um, and it, we just got it priced by a foundation in, in the Netherlands that does lots of sourcing of lots of stuff for Africa, and it's 11 euros. Well, if your budget for your health care is about a dollar a day for the whole population, are you going to spend 11 euros on that? Hmm. And then, of course, you've got the problem that, which is quite an interesting problem, and I'll uh, allude to this in Zambia, where they did the lumbar punctures, they made a diagnosis of meningitis. They then gave them amphotericin. And when you give amphotericin, you put a black bag around it because it's light sensitive. So you then have rows of patients with AIDS, with cryptococcal meningitis, with black bags. And those are the ones that die. So the relatives all realize that a lumbar puncture equals death and a black bag equals death. So if that's what you're going to do, I'm going to take him home. So there's some really interesting cultural issues around trying to get the doctors to do this, the patients to accept it, to actually get better outcomes. And unless you've got the drugs there and these rapid tests, you're actually not going to achieve it. So it's really quite an interesting and challenging chain of events to try and make this happen. So pneumocystis pneumonia is a uh, yeast-like organism. Up until, I think, uh, 88, 89, it was a parasite. Uh, and then it was sequenced by a chap called Edmund working in San Francisco, and it was discovered that it was a fungus, but it's a very strange fungus. It's a bit like a smut fungus, or a, uh, uh, um, uh, and, and it doesn't grow outside the human host. And every mammal has its own different pneumocystis species. So it's co-evolved with you know, the different monkey species, the different bat species. There's a horse pneumocystis, there's a rat pneumocystis, and so on. And, and never the twain shall meet. You can't get in, the human can't get infected by the rat one and vice versa. Um, and because it's so, so, so specialised in its, um, uh, where it lives, it doesn't grow. So you can't grow it. So you can't do a culture for pneumocystis. You have to see it, look at it, or you have to detect it molecularly. And um, so the microscopy is about 75% sensitive and real-time PCR is about 98% sensitive. Um, and it causes this, uh, bilateral shadows in the chest and you get very short of oxygen and this is a patient I looked after a long time ago and you die because of lack of oxygenation and you start treatment and they get worse before they get better um, and in Africa um, there have been various studies which have looked at this and you can see that the frequency or prevalence of disease it probably is an incidence really but anyway the prevalence is defined in the papers varies a lot, but it's more common in kids than it is in adults generally. And some of these patients, some of these studies have very low rates and others have quite high rates. So if you're going to apply a diagnostic across the ground, all right, let's imagine you're Mr. Minister for Health. You say, you've got to make a better job of making a diagnosis of pneumocystis. Um, you feel pretty comfortable making a di putting it in there, although you could argue, well, half the patients have got it anyway. I'll just treat them. Right? And you say, well, down here, well, I'm not going to bother because nobody's got it. So there's a challenge, again, about applying diagnostics depending on the rates that you've got in the different environments and how you apply that. The other interesting thing is that there's an inverse relationship with pneumocystis pneumonia 
and GDP. So you get more pneumocystis as developing countries come out of extreme poverty into sort of lower middle income uh, in terms of their GDP. In contrast to TB, which goes away as your, inc as your um, uh, income improves and GDP improves, which is really odd. And so, in fact, it's the, the very, very poor countries probably don't need this as much as the sort of the, the lower middle income and the middle income countries. And then you can argue, well, ceptrin or cotramoxazole is brilliant for preventing this infection. And actually, it's quite good. But if you take data from the States, where they looked at this up until 2001, where they knew exactly how to give all the prophylaxis, you can see that 1,000 patients still had pneumocystis, but a lot of them weren't in care, which is the same problem with cryptococcal meningitis. But 41% were taking, or at least were prescribed, prophylaxis. So even in the context of prophylaxis, you still get cases occurring. And we cannot, it's, it, it's not realistic to imagine that antiretrovirals alone will deal with that. And in this country, um, we are getting a rising rate of pneumocystis. Uh, it's not dramatic. These are not huge numbers of cases where it's sort of 350, 400 a year diagnosed with the molecular method in a centralized lab. So it's probably half the cases or a third of the cases that are actually there. But nonetheless, it's a rising frequency. Now, the diagnostics, just to go back to that, this is, one of, this is a really, really unusual study because this study compared four different diagnostics concurrently. And if you look in the literature for studies which have done even two diagnostics concurrently, there's only a few, and three and four is really unusual. And you can see here that MF, which is um, immunofluorescence microscopy, gives you about a 90% success rate. That calcofluor white, which is a, a fluorescent brightener on the surface of uh, pneumocystis, gives you about 75%. And GMS, which is the silver stains that we use for all fungi, gives you about 75%. And then DIFQIC, which is a, another sort of easier method, gives you only about a 50% hit rate. So you can make a diagnosis with these microscopy methods, but none of them is perfect. Um, and in contrast, the molecular diagnostics are a bit better. So there's your calcofluor. 71% on 400 specimens submitted to a lab. Please make a diagnosis of pneumocystis for me. So 7% is your baseline. Immunofluorescence was a bit better, which is what the last study showed, but PCR was better again. And actually PCR is 93% sensitive on all respiratory specimens and 100% on bronchialveolar lavage, um, where, and with a very high specificity, and 99% negative predictive value. So if, this, if it's negative, they haven't got pneumocystis. And that's a helpful because you could then stop treatment. Um, and we did a study in Namibia recently where we looked at sputum, ordinary sputum, because, of course, if you're in Africa, are you going to do a bronchoscopy? Uh, no. You haven't got a chest physician. You haven't got a bronchoscope. The electricity may be off, so you can't actually power the bronchoscope. And then you've got to sterilize it between each one and it takes you 40 minutes, and you've got a ward of 50 patients to see, you're not going to do it. But you might be able to collect phlegm. In fact, you can collect all phlegm. And that's, of course, what's done for TB, is to collect phlegm. Now, not everybody produces phlegm with pneumocystis or any other infection. But you can see here that the PCR and GMS were positive together in 17, and the PCR picked up eight there, and a lot of them were negative. And the point of the study is not that PCR is better, although it is slightly better. The point is that sputum works. You can use microscopy. You can use PCR. And these are frequent and easy to access specimens. So one of the things that Gaffey is doing is it's funded uh, some work with Lumora, which is a small company uh, based in uh, near Cambridge and Ely, that's developing molecular solutions for uh, uh, infections that are a problem in the developing world. And so they've got a, and patented a, a novel heat elution system which allows you to extract very high quality DNA from stool, from soil, and we've been trying it with respiratory fluids, to uh, then be able to do PCR on it. And, and that may not seem such a big deal, but if you go to a lab in this country, the extraction process can take you half an hour or you have to buy a big fancy machine to do it. And actually, if you can do that, and do that quickly in 10 minutes, uh, that is really good. 
And then combined with that, they have um, access to isothermal PCR um, so that they can do room temperature shipping. Because if you order molecular reagents in this country, it comes in dry ice generally. Well, you try shipping dry ice to you know, the northern parts of Uganda or Kenya. It's got to go through customs. It's, they've got to feed up the dry ice halfway through. It's got to get there without... It's difficult, and it costs a fortune as well. So sh real shipping in room temperature is really important. And they've also developed an inexpensive PCR machine, and so this is a 20-minute assay. So that means that the diagnosis of pneumocystis should be able to be made for less than $10 in about half an hour on expectorated sputum. And that's a transformational change in terms of trying to be able to make this diagnosis. We've got to deliver it, but we're a long way down the road of doing that already. And what happens to pneumocystis? Well, they all die if you don't treat, but overall around 85% will get better with septrin, high-dose cotrimoxazole, and steroids. And so that's worth doing. That's worth making the diagnosis. But equally, we don't want to treat everybody with high-dose cotrimoxazole. There's huge lots of side effects. So 90% of patients feel sick. Many of them vomit. You get rashes. You get abnormal... Uh, liver function tests, you get your white cell counts go down and so on. And if you treat everybody, let's imagine your rate is 5%, right? So you treat one patient, but 19 patients get this toxic set of drugs that don't need it. So that's a problem. And of course, steroids are not great for patients with TB and other infections, and they tend to get given as well. So the arguments for treating, for diagnosing pneumocystis are that if you don't diagnose them, all the patients die. If you make an early diagnosis, which is not possible in Africa at the moment, um, and it's difficult even in this country, you can avoid admission to hospital, you don't need to give steroids, and they have a better outcome. If you have empirical treatment, then you end up with all these toxicities, which otherwise you wouldn't need if you could exclude the diagnosis. And steroids are detrimental in patients with TB. So that's important. And the, once they're better from pneumocystis, they're better. These are, this doesn't damage the lungs. You're not left with gross abnormalities in the lungs. These are patients that go on and live for years if you can get them on antiretroviral therapy. So this is really worth achieving if you can do that. So histoplasmosis, this is a, a dimorphic fungus. So you breathe it in, it comes in through the lungs. It's a fluffy mold uh, in the environment, and it changes to a yeast form in the patient at 37 degrees. So there is an example on a blood film uh, of the yeast. It's intracellular inside macrophages and monocytes. And, um, and, you, and you get this dense infection, which you can see in a blood film in about 40% of AIDS patients. And sometimes you get a nice skin rash like this, but not always. Um, and it's a worldwide infection, apart from sort of northern, Af northern Europe. It basically doesn't occur here, um, and Canada, and bits of Russia, and so on. But it is otherwise worldwide. And, and it's very common in certain AIDS patients. You get disseminated disease in AIDS and chronic lung disease in others. And there's a fantastic, not quite as good as the crypto test, but not bad, 90% sensitivity urine antigen test. But the organism takes 10 days to two weeks to grow. So what was happening before was that these patients would come, they would do the cultures, and they'd treat them for TB. And about day 14, the lab would say, ah, oh, we've got histo. And that was the day the patient died. Brilliant. So we needed a more rapid test, and the antigen test does that. So there's a, lots of it in Indianapolis, Mississippi Basin. Other parts of, Afri of, of South Central and South America, a lot in Central America, it's related to bat caves. Those of you who go caving, if you're spelunkers, this is where you get exposure. And then in Africa, you've got various other um, uh, uh, areas here. Um, th they aren't more common than in um, South America. It's just the intensity of the, of the colours that have been used there. But actually, the maps in Africa are not very good. It's not very clear. Again, no survival if you don't treat. 87% with amphotericin and about 100% with the milder cases with itraconazole. And itraconazole is not on the essential medicines list for the WHO either. And as you saw, amphotericin is not always available. So then what do you use? Fluconazole. And it's about a 50-ish percent response rate only. So this is a disease which is n not easily diagnosable and not easily treatable currently in many, many places because of that problem.
And this is the, an example, if you look here, this is from uh, Guatemala. This is the frequency of the different diseases. They, they weren't, didn't have their antigen test in place here. This is pre-antigen testing, 3.8%, 40 patients. A lot of patients with wasting, and wasting equals tuberculosis and lots of things all put together. Um, but the mortality was 55%. That's, 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 so that's pre-antigen. They did have some of the drugs, but they couldn't make the diagnosis fast enough. And then chronic pulmonary spurgulosis after TB. So um, TB gives you cavities in the lungs, and then you have a damaged lung, and sometimes aspergillus, you breathe it in, and it can cause a chronic infection. And this is an example of a patient here with a fungal ball. This is the aspergilloma, which that's what it looks like. Um, and it, over uh, two years, she developed fibrosis, and the whole lung was lost. And the problem with these patients, they cough up a lot of blood. And so hemoptysis is a really big deal. And it, it, clinically, it's like TB. How do they present? Cough, tired, weight loss, um, and fatigue. And the one big difference is they don't get fever, whereas TB patients usually have fever. But otherwise, it looks like that, and the x-rays look similar. So if you don't have any diagnostics, what do you do? You treat them for TB. And so there's a lot of diagnostic treatment for TB, which is inappropriate. And these patients start with shadows like this, and untreated, you go on and develop cavitation up here, like this, with infiltration. And then you may develop a fungal ball, which is a really late manifestation of disease. But look how much lung has been destroyed up here and up here. And this girl, young 30-year-old, died about six months after this with this disease, essentially uh, first treated with TB, which it wasn't, and then with aspergillosis, and didn't really respond really well to treatment, but partly because she had such severe disease by the time you got there. And there's a fungal ball over here as well. So this is a tricky and difficult disease to manage. It comes in about four varieties. You've got nodule, you've got a simple aspergilloma, uh, which I'll show you an example of. You've got chronic cavitary disease, which is what I was just showing you there. And then you can progress, as I showed you in that first slide, to chronic fibrosing disease, otherwise called chronic progressive disease. And so here's your nodule, which looks like lung cancer. Um, here's your simple aspergilloma. This is a surgical disease. Surgeons are, can chop that out. And the results of surgery across the world are excellent if it's just a simple aspergilloma. It does sometimes recur, but, but basically they do well. Well, this is chronic cavity disease, bilateral cavities. And this is fibrosis. Uh, with a fungal ball in a, a cavity with a scarred lung in that side. And this is what the nodules look like. They get these um, bright PET scans positive, so they, 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 they light up and they look like lung cancer, but they're, but they're not lung cancer. And what happens to these patients is at variable periods of time, they progress and you get destroyed lung. So you go from these cavities here um, with a, a relatively normal lung here, two years later to a contraction on that side, loss of lung volume, and here complete loss of the left lung. And this is over a five-year time frame. There's a fungal ball in here, which you can just about see, and it's there and there. And, um, and this is what happens to these patients. This was a lady who'd had TB. She's from India, and she died about two years after this uh, x-ray was taken. And here's another example. Um, the first one, like I showed you, that she started with this cavity, then she got the fungal ball here, and then she went on to get fibrosis untreated. And so we treat these patients a lot um, with antifungals, as much as we possibly can. Whereas around the world, people aren't making the diagnosis and aren't treating them currently, and that's a problem for us. In Japan, they've taken a real interest in this disease, and this is a, a snapshot of a, a group of their patients where they grew aspergillus in this group of patients. That's, if you like, the control group. And these are the patients with chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. And 20% did badly uh, immediately, and then you lost about 80% of the patients over five years. So I don't know whether how you'd feel about being told that you had a disease where you've got about an 80% chance of being dead in five years, but you wouldn't be very happy about it. And at the moment, the problem is that even these patients are treated but if they're not diagnosed here, then you're very likely to die because actually you need antifungal therapy. So there was a randomized study done in uh, India um, by Ritesh Agarwal and colleagues, and they randomized patients to six months of itraconazole, 
or nothing, uh, and nothing equals a bit of antibiotic and inhalers and that sort of thing. And you can see after six months that a third of these patients were the same, uh, or one was slightly better, and two-thirds had deteriorated in contrast to those treated where a, a third were better, 40% were about the same, and a quarter did not respond. Okay? So that's a clear indication that therapy is helpful. Unfortunately, when they then did another phase of six months off therapy, you've got one more who's worse over here, but you've now got a 30% relapse rate within six months. So one of the things that we don't know clinically and one of the pieces of work to be done is to figure out who these patients are because they may not need treatment. We really want to know who these really good responders are because that's good because we'd like to do a bit more with these ones and get them better a bit more. And we really need to know who's going to relapse. And we don't know that. We don't have a specific marker to figure out which one, which patient is in which group at the moment. So it's observation and treatment and trial and error and all that stuff. Not ideal. What we really need is that. And so one of the programs we're doing in Manchester is looking at the genetics to try and figure out what are the genetic links related to this disease. Okay. So this disease follows tuberculosis. I mentioned that. Right. So it might surprise you to know that the, the only published study that really looked at the frequency of this was done in this country in the late 1960s and there's not been one since. And they, the Medical Research Council um, funded a study where they looked at 544 patients who had tuberculosis and had a cavity in the lung, and they then did Asperger's precipitins and a chest X-ray. Okay, so this is, of course, pre-CT scan, pre-bronchoscopy, pre-AIDS, pre-any oral antifungals as well. In fact, it's only just amphotericin only around about five or six years at this stage. So this is a long time ago in the history of medicine in terms of modern medicine. Okay, and they then followed them up again. This is 12 months after the finishing of TB. This is 48 months after finishing TB. And you can see that the rates here, 25% had antibodies, 17% had x-rays plus antibodies. Once you'd lost a few patients, some deaths, lost to follow up over there, you end up with a 36% rate and 22% rate here. Okay, so if you then look at, well, why, what about these patients with cavities? Who gets a cavity after TB? So these are two patients with um, tuberculosis scanned at the beginning of their TB, okay? And there is two, the same patients scanned at the end of treatment. So here is a patient with cavities, and here is a patient without cavities. Now, you can argue that, I think, that Actually, there's a bit of a cavity in there. It's quite not quite normal. But if you take this group, you end up with a, a, a proportion of patients who do have cavities post-TB, somewhere between 25 and 33%. And if you do all the maths on that, you end up with around 10% of patients from TB going on and get chronic pulmonary specialosis. So that's a lot. Um, and when you then calculate that, and sorry, and I should say that there have been other studies, that was this study, that's the 34%, which is the antibody rate at four years. In Japan, India, and Brazil, there's other studies looking at antibodies, and they're in the similar ballpark. And then when you try and calculate that across the world, you can see that that works at about 1.2 million patients and 375 new patients every year with this disease across the world. And if you calculate a, a, a if you calculate fifteen percent annual mortality or surgical resection, that's how many you end up with one point two million. So that's a lot of people. In India, we've done the same calculation recently, but with m up to date data. So of the one point two billion, two million get TB, and they have a really high mortality from TB in India. You can see about a third of the patients are dying. In this country, it's ten percent roughly. Okay? And in other parts of the world, it's 10%. So that's a big mortality. But you then take that number and you say, well, how many go on and get CPA? 92,000 new every year and nearly 300,000 in total predicted in India. That's a lot of people with a five-year 80% mortality. And if you look at mortality from TB versus all fungal infections, not just the CPA patients, you can see that the numbers are pretty similar. So, and we think that some of these TB deaths are actually uh, chronic pulmonary specialosis deaths. 
difficult to be quite sure what those uh, figures are because the data isn't there. But we think that some of the TB deaths aren't actually TB at all. Okay, so what about fungal keratitis? Just very briefly, this and chromoblastomycosis. So you've got, um, this is an injury-related disease. Um, it particularly occurs in the tropical parts of the world. Um, in this country, less than 10% are um, fungal. They're mostly bacterial, and sometimes they're related to contact lenses. In um, Malawi and um, Southeast Asia and so on, about half of the cases are fungal. There's 300 different species implicated. Aspergillus and Fusarium are the most important. Now, to make a diagnosis, you, in this country, the patient would see an ophthalmologist. They would put a local anaesthetic in the eye, and they would take a little scraping from the cornea there. I'm sure you're all delighted at the thought of that happening to your eye, if you had that. Um, and then you send that off to the lab, and you have to, you have to look under the microscope and see hyphae, and then you have to grow. OK. So now imagine, translate yourself from Edinburgh to Maputo in Mozambique, or actually about a town about 100 miles from Maputo. Do you think it's likely that there's going to be an ophthalmologist, a local anaesthetic, some, an ability, to, the instruments to do a corneal scrape, a microscopy experienced person, and a fungal lab? Uh, no. So how are we going to get this disease better? What are we going to do? Because you can't suddenly translate all the expertise here in America and so on and plonk them in Mozambique. It's not going to happen. Do we just accept it? it and it's a disease of young-ish people. It's a disease of the 20 to 40 age group. In fact, some of them are kids. Um, and it's in men. You can see in Hong Kong, India, Bhutan, Southeast Asia, it's really quite common. Big, 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 not a problem in Britain and Denmark. Um, and if you look at India, 10% of the cases of blindness in India are caused by keratitis. So trachoma takes the limelight, of course, and of course diabetes is important for cataracts, but cataracts are occurring in people who are over 50 for the most part. Right? This is disease occurring in young people. In Uganda, 25% of the blindness or, or impaired vision in kids is due to this. So how are we going to deal with that? So one of the things that we're doing is working on a point of care test where you can put an eye drop in the eye and with an um, iPhone attachment or equivalent, you can shine a little light, have it for us, take a photograph and make a diagnosis like that. That's one of the things that we think we can do. And, um, and in fact, there is a collaboration with one of your chemists in this, in this city who will help us, I think, with that. Because we don't actually see that we can put you know, microscopists and uh, fungal uh, lab people and ophthalmologists everywhere. We just don't think it's going to be feasible. And chromoblastomycosis. Here is a patient who had this disease in Brazil and was treated. Not very good treatment, I think you'd agree. And a horrible infection. So this is related to the th this, this two important fungi that cause this, and it's related to the surface of a Babusu coconut or other uh, agricultural products, <coughs> you get inoculated, you're working in the fields or whatever, and it's very itchy, and you itch, 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 and then you itch a bit more, and you itch a bit more, and you transport the fungus from here. So it's partly hygiene, uh, it's partly this local inoculation, and then maybe there's a susceptibility, genetic susceptibility, you don't know, but there may be, and then you get this horrible progressive infection. And you can resect it. If you pick it up early, you can cut it out and get rid of it. But, of course, the patients are still at risk with that. And as you can see, the antifungals are not very effective. And the map of the world is so poor, all we can report is where the cases are published from. Okay? So you can see that there's a lot of cases published from Brazil, a lot of from uh, China, and some Madagascar. But we just don't know across most of Africa and Indonesia and also parts of uh, South America. So we really don't know how big the problem is. No idea. And, but it clearly needs to be addressed because it's a horrible, chronic, difficult it is to treat infection. So, in conclusion, lethal fungal disease complicates AIDS and TB much more commonly than has been appreciated. 
One of the key goals of the UN AIDS program, which was set out in 2010, is to get to zero AIDS deaths. Somewhat aspirational, and yes, they're coming down a bit, but it is not going to happen until they can really, we can address fungal disease properly. So we can, a, antiretroviral therapy reduces crypto and pneumocystis, but it doesn't actually impact on histoplasmosis or pulmonary exposolosis. It won't make any difference to those infections. We do have the diagnostic and treatment tools, or we will have them soon. We barely understand quality of life issues. And there's a general, almost universal failure on a part of public health across the world to address these things. And that's something that really needs to be addressed. And those of you who are wondering about what you should do with your careers, understanding something about this area combined with, for example, HIV or TB or uh, ocular um, uh, epidemiology, this is an area fruitful because there's nobody else doing it at the moment and there's an opportunity there. We run the uh, LIFE program, which is an educational website for um, all healthcare professionals, students, pharmacists, nurses, physios, etc., um, uh, those working in the lab, uh, and in English and in Spanish. And there's a newsletter, you can sign up to this, and there's a newsletter which uh, gives you information, quite you know, recent papers and stuff, which is quite of interest uh, every quarter. Um, and that's the, the newsletter there. And that was the one about um, the WHO um, re reinstating amphotericin and flu cytosine, for example, to the central medicines list. And then the Gaffey website has also got quite a lot of information on it. It's got uh, dynamic maps of the frequency of disease, information about the six priority diseases that we've got, and also with availability of the drugs around the world. And with that, I'll stop. Happy to take questions. Many thanks.